Hello and welcome to your first class on Foundations of Canadian Law. My name is Achal and I will be your tutor throughout your process of studying for Foundations of Canadian Law and helping you pass this exam. Now, Foundations for Canadian Law is a very theoretical based exam. Some would compare it to a jurisprudence paper. At least the students with the Indian education know what I'm talking about. I'm not sure about the other countries though, but uh, this is a very theoretical based paper. The best part is that you don't have to memorize it all. It is an open book exam as we all know, so you need to keep your notes ready. If you haven't already secured a copy of notes, I would recommend you do that first because when you go through my classes, it will be great that you can always refer to the notes also because notes are much more detailed. Notes will help you in the exam to write the right content in your paper. In the exam, you will also get no time for essentially referring to your notes. So that's the most important part. And uh, even more important part is that once we go through the content, we'll also do classes on the exam workshop essentially to understand how to write the actual paper, how to analyze the actual question and so on and so forth. Now, I'm not going to bore you with this. I'm going to bore you with foundations of Canadian law. So let's get on with it. Now, the first chapter is basic theories of law, racism and the law. Now, today in the first chapter, we'll be discussing basic theories of law and how they relate to the issue of racism in the legal system. Legal theories are essential in shaping how judges make decisions and how laws are applied in practice. These theories offer different perspectives on the nature, source, authority, and accountability of laws. Firstly, let's define what legal theories are. Legal theories are frameworks that offer an understanding on how the law works. They help us in understand why law exists, where they come from, and how they should be enforced. There are several legal theories, but for today's discussion, we will focus on natural law theory, legal positivism, feminist perspective on law, critical legal studies, and law and economics. Now let's discuss the two descriptive theories of law, legal positivism and natural law. These theories focus on identifying what the law is as opposed to what it ought to be. Legal positivism, as described by John Austin, argues that laws are commands issued by a sovereign and backed by threats. The validity of a legal system is determined by whether it is habitually obeyed and this theory separates question of what the law is from the questions of what the law is ought to be. It does not take into account morality or justice. On the other hand, natural law theory posits that law are based on a universal moral code and the validity of a law is determined by whether it aligns with moral code. According to this theory, laws that do not align with the moral code are not truly valid. And the authority of a legal system is based on its adherence to the universal moral code. Both legal positivism and natural law offer compelling arguments as to the basic nature, origin, authority and responsibility of the law. They can affect judicial decision making and legal outcomes in different ways. For example, a judge who adheres to legal positivism may focus on the letter of the law, while a judge who adheres to natural law may focus on the spirit of the law and the morality behind it. So, in legal positivism, you focus on what the law is on by the book, by the paper, and for natural law, you focus on the morality angle. It is important to note that both theories have their own strengths and weaknesses and their use depends on the legal system and the legal problem at hand. In contrast to these descriptive theories, other theories such as general or class equality and efficient distribution of scarce societal resources are normative theories, which describe how existing law fails to achieve an external objective and focus on how law should be rather than what it is. Now we move on to the feminist perspectives on law, which is a normative theory 
seeking to describe how existing laws fail to achieve gender equality. Feminist legal theory examines the ways in which women are disadvantaged by legal rules and institutions and how these laws fail to address the unique needs of women. Feminism critiques liberalism as a political ideology and aims to establish a different vision of justice. It argues that laws should be designed to address the needs of women and promote gender equality. Feminist legal theory goes beyond the traditional liberal approach by recognizing the many ways in which women can be disadvantaged by the legal system and advocating for changes in law to address these issues. Early formalist feminism sought to replace laws that favored men with more gender-neutral laws, such as Women's Suffrage Act in Canada. This movement led to progress in women's rights, including the rights to vote and the rights to be considered for senatorial positions as seen in the Persons case or Edwards v. Attorney General of Canada, 1930. Contemporary feminism consists of different sects of varying beliefs, drawing on disciplines like criminology and sociology. The central theme is that if given the ability to reconstruct society, we could do a better job. An example of feminist theory in practice is R v. Morgenthaler case, which examined the constitutionality of abortion restrictions. Justice Wilson's concurring opinion focused on feminist topics such as rights in a wider social context, the female experience and the emotional issues. This decision exemplifies the importance of feminist perspectives in shaping law and promoting gender equality. Moving on to critical legal studies. A theoretical perspective that critiques traditional legal theories and scholarship. Descended from legal realism, critical legal studies argues that legal rules are not neutral and objective but are subject to multiple interpretations and influenced by unstated policy preferences of judges. Critical legal studies takes this critique further by attacking traditional legal theories and education, rejecting the liberal belief in the certainty and the naturalness of law. Instead, it argues that law reproduces the oppressive characteristics of contemporary Western societies and that the rule of law is indeterminate, full of subjective interpretations and incoherent. The critical legal studies movement is often associated with the left and is considered a radical alternative to established legal theories. It argues that the law not only reflects but also institutionalizes and legitimates the authority and the power of particular social groups. An example of critical legal studies in practice is the case of R versus RDS, in which the judges dealt with the issue of race differently than in the case of Ray Drummond Wren and Ray Noble and Wolf. The critical legal studies perspective would analyze this decision in terms of the underlying power dynamics and how law reinforces or challenges the dormant social order. The three stages of governing the application of critical legal studies are Hegemonic consciousness, which refers to the idea of Western laws are maintained by a system of beliefs reflecting the interests of dominant class, often reinforcing the status quo. The second is reification in which the beliefs that maintain Western laws are presented as essential and objective, making the current system appear natural and unchangeable. And the third one is denial, where the laws and legal thinking aid in the denial of real truths justify or masking societal issues such as injustice and inequality, reinforcing the dominant social order. In summary, Critical legal studies seek to unmask the power dynamics in the law, highlighting how laws and legal thinking can reinforce the dominant social order and often deny alternative perspectives and solutions. Now let's discuss the law and economics theoretical perspective, which applies economic analysis to legal rules in order to assess whether the rules will result in an efficient outcome. This approach has been applied to various areas of law such as contract law, crime, torts, family law, property, legislation, abortion and many more. Efficiency is often defined in terms of Pareto optimality, meaning 
that the welfare of relevant parties can no longer be maximized except at the expense of the other parties. One main criticism of law and economics is its tendency to ignore questions of distributive justice while focusing solely on efficiency. The economic theory of regulations or public choice theory applies basic economic theory to understanding public policy. It attempts to explain government intervention as a corrective to mark failure and seek to understand why some government programs seem to run counter to the public good and do not maximize the public good. Law and economics raises several important questions such as what is the problem that a legal rule or structure is attempting to solve? What effect does this rule have on society? Why do we have laws that we have? And should we have different laws? An example of law and economics can be applied in practice in the case of Bank of America, Canada versus Mutual Trust Company. In this case, the court applied the economic theory of regulation to analyze the case. In summary, Law and economics offers a unique perspective on legal rules, emphasizing efficiency and potential consequences of these rules on society. Okay, now let's discuss the first case law, R versus Morris. In this case, the Ontario Court of Appeal heard an appeal regarding firearms possession. The central issue of the appeal was the extent to which considerations of anti-black racism must be incorporated into sentencing decisions. This case involved Morris who was sentenced to one year imprisonment for firearms possession, which was seized during his arrest on unrelated charges. Justice Nakatsuru's decision in the trial reflected an increasing attention towards the circumstances of racialized offenders in criminal trials. He admitted two reports relevant to Morris's situation. The first report was Expert Report on Crime, Criminal Justice and the Experience of Black Canadians in Toronto, Ontario, which highlighted historical and social factors influencing the predicament of black Canadians. The second report was a social history of Kevin Morris, which was prepared by a clinical social worker and provided evidence of Morris's socio-economic and personal circumstances. Justice Nakatsuru held that these reports, particularly Morris's personal circumstances, were mitigating factors and had significant bearing on his sentence as per section 718.2, subsection E of the Criminal Code. This section is used by the courts to consider all relevant sanctions other than imprisonment for an offender when available, with particular attention to the circumstances of indigenous offenders. However, Justice Nakatsuru noted that same approach should be applied to offenders from other marginalized groups, including black offenders, and that the sentencing principles established in R versus Gladue should be applied more broadly. The Court of Appeal upheld the decision of the trial judge, emphasizing the importance of addressing anti-black racism in sentencing decisions. The next case is 8531238573123 Canada Incorporated versus Keeley Shefford Plaza Incorporated. In this case, the landlord appealed an order enjoining it from terminating the tenancy of the tenant due to the tenant's failure to give timely written notice of its intention to exercise an option to renew the lease. The tenant failed to give written notice prior to the date set out in the lease. The application judge found that the tenant had initiated the lease renewal process by attempting to contact the landlord and its property manager before and after the option exercise date. However, the calls were not returned and were studiously avoided. The judge also found that the tenant had acted in good faith and had made substantial investments in the premises and had never missed a rent payment. The judge determined that landlord's desire to replace the tenant was motivated by racism rather than the prospect of higher rent. On appeal, on appeal the landlord did not challenge the application judge's legal analysis concerning relief from forfeiture but argued that there was no evidence that the tenant made diligent and timely efforts to exercise its option to renew. The court found that the landlord had not demonstrated a palpable and overriding error in application judge's assessment of the evidence and that the judge was entitled to accept the tenant's evidence in preference to the landlord's. 
The legal ratio of this case is that landlords attempt to terminate a lease due to tenants' failure to give timely notice of their intention to exercise an option to renew the lease may be enjoined if the tenant can demonstrate that they acted in good faith, that they had made substantial investments in the premises, and that the landlord's desire to replace the tenant was motivated by discrimination. Additionally, the court found that the landlord's lack of responsiveness to the tenant's effort to renew the lease and the landlord's insulting response to a communication from the tenant's lawyers can be considered as evidence of discrimination. The court also found that landlords' lack of evidence of financial loss also weighed in favor of the tenant. Okay, the last case of this chapter is R versus Gladue. In this case, an Aboriginal woman pleaded guilty to manslaughter for killing of her common law husband and was sentenced to three year imprisonment. The issue at hand was whether the sentencing judge gave any special consideration to the accused's Aboriginal background and whether the principles governing the application of section 718.2 subsection E of the criminal code were followed. Section 718.2 subsection E of the criminal code is a mandatory provision that requires sentencing judge to consider all available sanctions other than imprisonment and to pay particular attention to the circumstances of Aboriginal offenders. This provision is designed to address the problem of over-representation of Aboriginal people in prisons and to encourage a restorative approach to sentencing. The court held that the sentencing judge did not give any special consideration to the accused's Aboriginal background and did not follow the principles governing the application of Section 718.2 subsection E of the Criminal Code, dismissed the accused's appeal of her sentence. The court emphasized that the effect of Section 718.2 subsection E is to alter the method of analysis that the sentencing judge must use in determining a fit sentence for Aboriginal offenders directing judges to undertake the sentencing of such offenders individually but also differently because of the unique circumstances of Aboriginal people in Canada. Hello, I am uh, editing, recording this part of the video a little later. Uh, since there was an update in the syllabus, there are two new articles that were added to chapter number one. So, here we are discussing them. The first article that has been added to this course is from Michael Treblecock, who uh, wrote this article in 1993 on law and economics. We will deep dive into this article that offers a unique perspective on law through the lens of economics. This approach seeks to understand how economic principles can be applied to predict, understand and evaluate legal rules and policies. The first part is about a conceptual overview of economic perspective of law. There are two styles of economic analysis that have been discussed. First one is positive analysis and the second one is normative analysis. The positive analysis approach predicts how individuals will behave within the legal framework. It assumes they act normally to maximize their well-being. For instance, if taxes increase on a product, how might the consumers respond? The normative analysis is about evaluating legal rules based on economic criteria. It is not just about what people will do, but what they should do for the most efficient outcome. However, while the economics provides a valuable lens, it is not the only one. We must remember to balance it with other values and perspectives. The second part of the article is about applications of economic analysis of law. Here, various kinds of laws have been discussed. Let's just go through them. First one is property rights. As urban areas grow, we see new forms of property rights like condominiums or timeshares. These changes reflect on economic realities of increasing population density and urbanization. In contract law, at its core, contract ensures fair play. It prevents opportunistic behavior by ensuring that if one party fulfills their end of deal, the other will too. It reduces transaction costs by providing standard terms, saving parties from lengthy negotiations. It discourages carelessness by holding parties accountable for their mistakes. And it ensures exchanges are mutually beneficial. Let's talk about tort law. Tort law is about liability. The goal is to find rules 
that efficiently minimize the cost of accidents and their prevention. Moving on to corporate law. This delves into the behaviors of firms. Why do some firms contract out services while others keep them in-house? Let's move on to competition law. In competition law, we can see economic analysis has shifted this area's focus from just market share to a more dynamic framework emphasizing factors like barriers to entry. In international trade law, this touches on the debates like fair trade versus free trade. How do regional trading blocks like the EU impact global trade dynamics? In criminal law, have you look at the penalties for crimes, especially white collar ones. The goal is to set penalties that deter crime efficiently. In family law, this explores the dynamics of marriage from an economic perspective. For instance, how do no-fault divorce reforms impact the decision to marry? In access to justice, this looks at the economics of the legal system itself. Why are there court delays? How can litigation be financed efficiently? In immigration law, Economic insights suggest that immigrants can be beneficial for the economy, contrary to some popular beliefs. In conclusion, while economics offer a valuable tool for understanding legal phenomena, it's essential to integrate it with other perspectives. Law isn't just about efficiency, it's about justice, equality and societal values. Now let's move on to the next article that has been introduced in the new syllabus. Now let's move on to the next article which has been introduced in the new syllabus. The author of this article is Alicia Clutterbuck. Uh, the name of the article is Rethinking Baker, a Critical Race Feminist Theory of Disability. This article starts by introducing us to a term that you might have heard before, which is called intersectionality. This isn't a buzzword. It is a concept that describes the overlapping of intersectional social identities and systems of oppression or discrimination that come with them. To bring this concept to life, the article uses Mavis Baker's case. Mavis Baker was a Jamaican-born black woman with a disability, and her case highlights the and her case highlights the intricate challenges of navigating Canadian legal system as a racialized disabled woman. And the first thing that we'll discuss from this article is disability, the margins of critical race feminism. One of the main critiques of the article is how legal scholarship sometimes equates or even analogizes ableism with racism. While it might seem a valid comparison on the surface, such analogies can be overly simplistic. They can miss out the unique challenges faced by disabled people of color. The article warns against what's termed as disability essentialism. This is when we generalize the experiences of all disabled individuals, thereby overlooking the distinct challenges faced by disabled people of color. The next part of this article is intersectionalizing disability. Diving deeper into Baker's case, this article scrutinizes the Supreme Court of Canada's decision. While the court's decision was rooted in the procedural fairness and the best interests of Baker's children, the article argues that this approach missed the mark on addressing intersectional issues. In the next part, we discuss intersectional disability and the limits of the law. Here, we've introduced a term called administrative violence. It is a way to describe the harm caused by state-administered services that on the surface seem neutral but end up marginalizing certain groups. The Canadian immigration system, for instance, is critiqued for its biases against marginalized individuals, particularly disabled women of color. The Carmelita Haynes case is brought up an example to shed light on these systematic issues. Okay, we move on to part number two. This article doesn't stop at the Baker case. It further analyzes the biases evident in the notes of Officer George Lorenz and the border implications and the broader implications of the case. It also delves deeper into the concept of administrative violence, especially within the Canadian immigration system. Up, this article emphasizes the significance of an intersectional approach in legal scholarship and jurisprudence. The author passionately advocates for centering the experiences of disabled women of color in discussions about anti-discrimination and human rights law. 
The Canadian immigration system, along with broader societal structures, is critiqued for its failure to recognize and address intersectional challenges. In essence, this article isn't just a critique, it's a call to action, it's a reminder of integrate layers of intersectionality, especially in the realm of law. It highlights the urgent need for a more inclusive and comprehensive approach to understanding the and addressing the unique challenges faced by the marginalized individuals. Thank you for paying your attention. I hope I was able to summarize these two articles. I will see you in the next class, which is now Indigenous Peoples and the Law. See you in the next class. Bye.